And welcome to Carmichael Community Bible Church. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our virtual experience, worship experience. And uh, we want to thank all of you who have joined us on Zoom, who have joined us on Facebook, and who are joining us on YouTube. We are delighted every week that you join us. May the Word of God minister to you today in a special way. Thank you for your generosity. Those of you who are supporting the ministry with your prayers, with your attendance, and with your gifts. We are grateful because God loves a cheerful giver and we want to continue to expand the kingdom of God. And uh, we want to make sure that we are going all in for Jesus. Listen carefully to what God would say to you and let him speak to you through his servant, Pastor Livingston Edwards. God bless you, brother, as you minister the word today. Good morning, CCBC. It's a privilege again to be able to talk to you this morning about stewardship. Um, first of all, I want to just say thank you to Pastor Edgecombe for the wonderful introduction. We're certainly privileged in this time to be able to consider the principle of stewardship because there are a lot of demands on our time and on our, our lives. Um, so we need to be reminded that our first obligation is that we are stewards of the Most High. Uh, this morning, I want to just remind you again that we continue to take heed to all of the recommendation of the washing of the hand, the social distancing, the wearing of the mask and all the good stuff that goes along with that. We need to protect ourselves as much as we can in light of the multitude of persons that are now being infected uh, is a little bit more difficult. So we need to be a little bit more cautious in how we go about our daily lives. Before we look into the Word of God this morning, I want to just pause for a moment that we can go before his throne in prayer. 
Our Father and our God, we thank you for the privilege that we have to open the Word of God. We thank you that the Spirit of God is the one that empowers the Word of God to transform our lives. So we ask now, Lord, as we meditate upon the truth of the Word of God, that our lives would be transformed, that we would become better servants of the Most High. Father, that in everything that we do, we may both honor and glorify you. So be with us now as we open the Word and as we share the Word of God with your people. We ask that it would live in our souls. In Christ's name, amen. This morning we're going to continue a little bit from where we left off last week. Uh, last week we, we saw Paul having the correct view of himself. He said, first of all, in, in the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, I want you to think of me as a minister. And the word minister, we said, is the word slave or a servant. He says, I want you to think of me as a servant of God. You see, because... As I made mention last week, the church of Corinth, they had a little bit of problem with Paul, Apollos, Peter, and everybody else. Um, everybody thought that Paul had a big head, but I said he had a big heart. And uh, he dearly loved the believers there at the church of Corinth. But we want to look at, in, in addition to the two points from last week where he was a servant, and then he recognized himself as a steward, um, we want to go ahead and talk about something else that is mentioned in the text that we read last week. So before we go any further, let's, let's go back to the text again for just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 1 and 2 in particular this morning. Let a man so account of us as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it, was, it is required of a steward that a man be found faithful. Now, I want to just take the mo a moment to, to point out to you the, the two words that he used again in verse number one. First of all, he says, I'm a minister, or I'm a, I, I'm a born slave of Jesus Christ. That's of Jesus Christ. He said, but my stewardship, take a, take a note at it. He said, my stewardship is to the mystery of God. Now, there's a slight difference between the two. He says, my stewardship has to do with my ministry. My position as a bond slave has to do with my devotion to my Christ and my God. Now, this morning we want to take up and we want to look at that mystery that he, he spoke about in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. Um, and I want to encourage you in your spare time to read both 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 4 and 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and 4 because they have a lot in common and they help you to get a better grasp of what we're talking about this morning. So let's, let's now flip over to the verse that we used again last week from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and the verse that we referenced last week was verse number 7. It says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And I, 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 like I said last week, verse 1 is all we're going to cover. Verse 2 is all we're going to cover today. Uh, Lord willing, if the Lord spare my life, I would get the privilege to do it, the, the conclusion, next week. But uh, today we want to focus our attention like a laser on verse number 2. Verse number 2, we, we want to pull out a few things for you. Sorry, verse number 2 of chapter 1 but verse number 7 of chapter, uh, chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians now, chapter 4, 
verse number 7. I want to focus our attention on verse number 7, where he says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Now, the question is, what is the treasure? He says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The treasure that he is referring to is, if I may sum it up, is the truth of the gospel, the experience of the gospel, and the word of God that is in gospel format, that the truth of Jesus Christ being born of a virgin, died on the cross of Calvary, and raised again from the dead. But Paul says, says it this way. Verse num number seven, I want to look at three things that we want to pull from verse number seven. First, we want to look at the value of the treasure. Man, what a wonderful treasure we have in this earthen vessel. And the text tells us that God didn't by chance choose the vessel that he had placed the treasure in. The treasure is in this vessel by a deliberate choice of God. First of all, I want to talk about, before we go into looking at the vessel, I want to talk about the treasure. There are some things I want you to note concerning the treasure that we have been given. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in, uh, sorry, Colossians chapter 1, verse number 27 says, To whom... God would make known what is the riches of the glories of this mystery among the Gentiles. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is in itself, itself the essence of the gospel. Christ in us being the hope of glory. Let's talk about the value of of the treasure. The value of the treasure, first of all, is that the treasure costs God everything. It cost him his only begotten son, Jesus, who being the very God of the very God, who being the unique son of God, thought it not robbery, thought it not a thing the text tells us to be grasped after, but he made himself of absolutely no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and at the end of the day it says that he became subject to death on a cruel cross. That in itself is the essence of the gospel. So the value of the gospel is, first of all, that it cost God everything. It, it, it bankrupt him. Everything that he had was invested in his son, so therefore God says, I'm willing to pay the price. Secondly, I want to also point out to you that this treasure that he says that we have an earthen vessel is a unique treasure. It's one of a kind. In every other religion around the world, the followers have to do something in payment for their God. Christianity is the only organization, or if you please, religion, where God does everything for those that follow him. Now, I, I rather do it that way. You see, God makes the provision for us in Christianity. Every other religion, the, the followers then must make the provision for the God. So that all of that lends to the value of the treasure that we have in this earthen vessel. The, the fact also is that the text tells us that if we read the, 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 the text in, in, in 2 Corinthians, it tells us that this treasure that we have is eternal. It's forever. This treasure lasts. Everything around us may fail. Everything around us may give way. But this treasure, the truth of Jesus Christ being the ransom for our sins, is an eternal truth. The thing that excites me most about the treasure, it's because of the treasure 
that we have the privilege of not just being followers of Jesus Christ, but the text tells us that God then come and live within us. The text tells us also that we are sealed by him. We have this mark in our bodies, Paul says, of Jesus Christ. So the treasure is eternal. And it tells us also that this treasure is likened unto a great light. In the verses that comes before, it tells us that the light has shine, shined into the world, into darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. You see, but what we are saying to you today is that the, the, the treasure that you and I possess is the message of the gospel of Christ, that you and I have the obligation to communicate to others. You and I have the responsibility to tell others of a Savior. This glorious treasure is likened unto a great light. I want to take the opportunity just for a moment to demonstrate to you how precious this treasure is. You see, because... And not only the treasure, but also the packaging. Because what we need to understand, if I were to, if you were in person, I can demonstrate it a little bit better. Because if I set before you a beautifully wrapped package and a common paper bag, and I give you the option of choosing which one you think has the greater value, 90% of you would choose the beautifully wrapped package. Very few of us, if any at all, would choose the simple old brown paper bag. You see, that's why God was very meticulous in his decision-making process as to what would be the container in which he put this great treasure. The treasure of the gospel is very important to him. The treasure of the gospel is essential in our relationship with our God. In essence, what God is saying, I've invested in you. I've placed within you the responsibility to tell men of a Savior called Jesus Christ. So you and I have an obligation and you and I need to take it very serious. We have the responsibility to bear in our bodies this treasure. Secondly, I want to talk about another thing that this passage referenced. In this number 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it didn't only say that we have a treasure, but it says this treasure is in earthen vessels. That means that it's in clay jars. It's in disposable packaging. You know, it's not like you go to eat a fine meal and you sit down and you get the most expensive dinner. No, in this case, it's like taking a carry-out plate. I know that's a poor example, but in essence, that's what it is. You don't get the fine... See, you're not paying attention to the fine china. The, the, the focus is the meal in the plate, not the china on which it sits. The focus of the, of the meal is not on the styrofoam packaging that it's in, but it's the meal that's in the plate. You and I have a tendency to think more about package than we do about content. Paul says, so God chose to put this treasure in earthen vessels. Now, let me, let me suggest to you, he could have chosen angels. He could have chosen angels. He could have placed the treasure in angels. But it won't have the same effect. You see, because if he had placed the treasure in the angels, then guess what? We would be mesmerized by angels and we would start worshiping angels. So God, no, that wouldn't work. So God chose rather to put the treasure in the earthen vessels. That's you and I. The problem we have with earthen, this earthen vessel 
is this earthen vessel sometimes has a tendency to try or to hide the gift or the treasure that's within. Sometimes the packaging then take away from the gift. Very quickly, very quickly, let me say to you that, let me demonstrate to you what he is referring to when he says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. In the book of Judges chapter 7, I want to reference particularly verse number 16. In Judges chapter 7, the story is told about Gideon going against the enemy. And taking the children of Israel with him. And God said to Gideon, Gideon, listen, you got too many people. Because if I were to give you the victory with all these people, they're going to say they did it by their own hand. So I want you to get rid of some of them. And God went through the process, the elimination process. At the end of the day, you know the story well, how he chose the, one that, the ones that lapped like a dog uh, uh, in, in taking up the water. Uh, he says, he says, Gideon, I want you to take 300 men with you. And in the process, he said, Gideon, I want you to, to divide the 300 men into three groups. I want them to take in their hands. I want it to take in one hand. I want them to take the trumpet. In the other hand, I want them to take an empty vessel with a light under it. And when I... Give the indication. You are to blow the trumpet and break the pitcher. In essence, what he is saying, that this treasure that he had placed within us is like the light under the pitcher in the hands of the children of Israel, whom he asked to break the pitcher. The pitcher was disposable. The pitcher was able to be broken. Nothing, nothing missing. Because the emphasis was on the message that was inside the pitcher. Had they not broken the picture, the enemy would have never seen the light. They would have never been able to rout the enemy and have the victory. So what I'm saying to you, God had placed in our physical bodies. Well, that may be a little like uh, taking it a little far. But God had placed in our souls, not our physical body, had placed in our, in our souls a very precious treasure. And he is saying now, he wants us to deliver the treasure. Sometimes, though, as I said before, the packaging gets in the way. Sometimes you and I like to think that it's about us. We like to make it all about us. We like to focus the attention on us. We, and sometimes when we try to present Christ, we are ineffective because it's too much of us being seen. It's more about us than it is about him. So whenever you think about this treasure that you have within you, I want you to remember the story of Gideon and the children of Israel. That the, the picture needs to be broken for the light to be revealed. Let me help you with something. You may not know how to break the picture, but God knows how to break the picture. You see, because it's not until the picture is broken that the light can be seen. You and I need to understand that God is focusing on the treasure within, not the vessel that contains the treasure. The container is mortal. The container is transient. The container is fading away. But the message or the treasure is eternal. God always intended the vessel to be exactly that. So that when they look at us, they would realize that there is nothing about us. It's nothing about us, but the power, as the verse says, and the excellency is of God and not of us. You see, because man see us as themselves. We are all of the same substance, so to speak. So they realize that the message that we carry 
is not presenting ourselves. The message is about Jesus. So I want to say to you this morning that God is not telling you that you worth nothing. No, don't misunderstand me. That's not what he is saying. He is not saying that you have no value. But what he is saying, in essence, when you compare the value of the container to the value of the treasure, then the value of the container is minuscule. The value of the container has little importance when you contrast it to the value of the treasure. You and I need to remember that it's not about us, but it's about what we contain. Last week I told you that the value of the treasure, uh, sorry, the value of the container has nothing to do with the container, but the value of the container has to do with the value of the treasure that it contains. And that's still true. There is something else that is said. La the final point I want to give you for today there is something else that is said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And there is something else that he says. He says in verse number 7, not only that we have this treasure in earthen vessel, but he says there is a purpose why God had chosen to put it in us rather than the angel. He said the reason that we have this treasure and earthen, broken, damaged vessels, marred vessels. You see, because in the life of the children of Israel, many times they, they kept the clay jars that, or the clay dishes that was damaged as a container to put other things in. Well, that's sort of a what we are. Yes, it still has meaning, it still has value, but when it's compared with the content, it has no real value. The value is transient. I, I want to say to you that the Word of God tells us there is a reason why God chose that type of vessel. The reason God chose that type of vessel to place the, the treasure in is because, he says, the emphasis and the focus, emphasis and the focus is to be on the treasure and not on, on, on the container. Last point, the source of the power. Verse number 7 again of Second Corinthians chapter 4. Verse number 7. The reason he put this treasure in earthen vessel, it says that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. In essence, God don't anticipate God never anticipated you to be the source of the power. God never anticipated you to be the one that energizes the message. The message is energized by His Holy Spirit. The message is empowered by that same Holy Spirit that lives within us. You see, that's why it's, it's imperative that you understand that the Spirit of God that lives within you, works in you, both to will and to do for His good pleasure. The same Spirit that lives within us, the same Spirit of God that lives in us both to will and to do for His good pleasure, the same one that He has sealed us with and has given to us as a guarantor that at the end of the day we will, we will be going to glory, is the same one that empowers the Word of God. The same one that makes the Word of God have, have significance and power in our lives. The same one that causes the Word of God that, to be able to change us. It's amazing, hey? Some people can read the Bible and they read it like a textbook. Others can read it and it transforms their lives for eternity. That's the power of the Spirit of God. The word, the excellency of the power in the original language has the idea of the overwhelming power. The power that has the ability to transform life. 
the power that has the ability to make you and I everything that God wants you to be. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8 says, tells us that after He, the Holy Spirit, comes upon us, He will empower us. The power is not of us. The power does not dwell in our flesh. The power dwells in our soul. That's the indwelling Holy Spirit. The power to transform our, our lives and to transform the lives of others when we communicate with them the truth of the gospel. Let me say this to you. The reason God had to choose the vessel that he chose is because he wanted to make sure that we understand that the most holy person was not holy enough to carry the treasure. He wants us to understand that the most mighty man was not mighty enough to bear the treasure. He wanted us to realize that the richest man was not rich enough to be the bearer of the treasure. The purpose is that he just simply wanted clay jars. That's you and I. That they may, everybody may know that the excellency and the power is of God and not of us. If you read the, last, the latter part of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you would begin to get from this 8 down. And I wish time would have permitted me to do this this morning with you. But I want to encourage you to read it in your spare time. Paul tells us how God breaks the vessel. Paul tells us, he says, God has a way of crushing us by trials, by tribulation, by hardship, by difficulties that comes in our life. God has a way of breaking the jaw that the light may be seen. So sometimes you may wonder why the difficulties come, the hardship comes into your life. I want to suggest to you is because God is trying to make the light that's within, be seen. God is trying to reveal the light. Um, very quickly, last verse for, the, for the, this morning. Chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians again, verse number 18. Paul says, you and I need to remember that the things we see are not important. It's the things that we don't see. Our relationship with God is more significant. Our faithfulness to God and carrying the message is more significant than anything else we can do. The power comes from God. It's not embedded in us, not invested in us. It's invested in the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Let's pause together for prayer, please. Our Father and our God, we thank you that we are vessels. That's all we are, Lord. We are clay jars. Yes, Lord, we have value. We have meaning to you. But Lord, when it's compared with the treasure that we possess, our value uh, is minuscule. Our value is very, very little. Father, the world don't revolve around us, even though sometimes we think it does. We ask now, Father, that you may cause us to understand that it's all about you, not about us. It's all about the treasure within. Christ in us, he says, is the hope of glory. So we ask now, Lord, that we may live as that we are possessed with a holy God. Have your way in our lives now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you very much for your attention. And I trust that what was said this morning would have benefited you in some way. That you may realize that your relationship with God is that of a servant or that of a steward. That you may be faithful in doing His work. Amen. God bless you. May the favor, may the favor be upon